All right, well, good morning, everybody. We're back with Reconstruction, the Deep Roots of Early Christianity. Uh, again, my name is Mako Nagasawa. I'm the director of the Gnosticist Center for Christian Education and Ministry. Uh, a special thanks to Ian and Biota who are at McDonald's who are here and kind of the TAs and helping me to time and pace and plan the class. The, uh, the, the reason why we do this again, I always like to reiterate that um, uh, deconstructing Christian faith is fairly common these days. It, it can feel unnerving uh, both to people, at, well, you know, to people looking at it happening from outside, but, but also for the person doing the deconstructing because we, we don't know exactly where we'll end up. The, it raises the question, why do we construct things at all? And I like to think that we construct houses, schools, uh, you know, places uh, of public gathering because we want to be in community. And so uh, construction and, and reconstruction is important because of that. It, it helps us not feel alone. It helps us build community with other people. It helps us invite folks in. And, and I think it really is important because uh, to me in my own deconstruction, reconstruction journey, because I really love Jesus, but it makes me ask the question, how do we uh, know anything about Jesus? And, and what do we share about him with other people? Early Christianity helps us discern a strong foundation for that. Uh, because we're getting folks in a, in a decentralized organization who are fairly committed to things. And so the methodology here is to identify controversial issues that are commonly debated today in Western Christianity, especially in the U.S. We're going to look at early Christian views on the issue and identify if, where, and why Christians shifted on the issue. Uh, we, we hope to recover a framework for approaching the issue in today's context. All right, so today we're looking at scripture. Is the Bible the product of empire or violence? And uh, actually, that, that's how I planned it in the original kind of syllabus. I wound up switching the, uh, the, uh, the, in the, the actual title. So is the Bible the product of violence and empire? And that's pretty important <clears throat> because it, it is uh, unnerving uh, to sometimes look at violence or to think about violence. Uh, and, and, and is the Bible the product of a, a group controlling other people, it, it threatening violence? And so this is the outline for today. We're going to look at the many uses of history. We'll look at Israel, the justifications for violence, because most of the concerns prop up uh, pop up in the Old Testament. We'll look at before the Sinai Covenant, and most of our time will be spent in the Sinai Covenant in relation to the Canaanites. Uh, we'll look at, then we'll have some discussion. I forgot to put that in there. And then we'll uh, talk about Israel as a whole. Is it an empire or is it an anti-empire? And is the uh, Old Testament the result of kind of an imperial faction within Israel? And we'll look at that. And then we'll talk about the canonization of the Old Testament very briefly. So the many uses of history. Um, many of us, uh, you may know that uh, modern Turkey denies very vigorously that there is an Armenian genocide, whether it is that the, the word genocide, they really do not want to use that, uh, or the, the, the number of deaths itself, like the actual historical events, and um, you know the the crimes, the death, the burials, all of that. And so there's a there's a kind of spectrum of opinion about how much do they tolerate. But but this comes up from time to time because politically, uh, many other countries in the world want to acknowledge it, including the U.S. Um, but it is difficult. So it it highlights though the the fact that regimes love to control history. And that is just as true now as it was back then. And uh, it was easier to do um, back then because fewer people were, were literate, right? And so ancient and other examples of this would include ancient and modern China. Uh, censors censorship in modern China is notorious. And you look at ancient Egypt, for example. Uh, they never recorded any of their defeats. And, and for example, there was this period of Hyksos supremacy for about 200 years uh, in this period, 1786 to 1550 before Christ, 
And, and there's just absolutely no record of it in Egypt itself. There's records elsewhere and, and there's like other physical indications, but there's no uh, hieroglyphics, there's, there's no literature about it. So that just raises this question. When we talk about history and we talk about the literature that's produced, uh, especially by ancient peoples, we have to ask who produces the ideas and who preserves the literature. Both of those questions are really important. It's not just enough to, to ask who produces the ideas, but how, how does this stuff get preserved? <laughs> how, and, and in relation to the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, uh, we have to ask what is going on? Who preserves it? Um, hold on just one second, I apologize. I'm gonna pause this. Okay, thanks for your patience here. The, uh, moving on. All right, so in Israel, there are justifications for, in the Old Testament, there are justifications for, for violence or they are implied. So um, we, we'll look at a few of those. So here, here is a brief history of how the Bible represents the history of violence. So in Genesis four, after the fall and after the exile, Cain murders his brother Abel. And then uh, God has this interaction with Cain where God does not actually um, uh, put Cain in a, in a prison. He doesn't strike Cain dead. He, he puts some kind of mark on Cain to protect him, but says, you're going to wander because the land is not going to be fruitful for you. But Cain instead settles down. So th that's a dead giveaway of like something weird is happening here. And he names a city after his son Enoch. And in that city, there is the beginnings uh, or, uh, of institutionalized violence. And, and it's so in his lineage that in his, his family that this happens within um, some unspecified number of years, but within two chapters uh, of scripture, there's overwhelming human violence. And in response to that, God protects the family of faith. Implied is that Noah and his family are holding on to this promise God made about sending a human champion, like the seed of the woman prophecy of Genesis three. And, and so the, the implication is that they were in danger and uh, it, the, the ark and stuff was open to more people, but no one took them up on it. So the flood comes and, and protects them. Um, does that really work? Well, kind of. So after that, uh, God permits reciprocal limited violence. He says, uh, uh, if anyone sheds man's blood or human blood by, by human blood, he, human hands, his blood will be shed. Uh, however, there is a second city called Babel. Uh, it is built by Nimrod, who is a city builder, an empire builder. If you, if you look at all of the cities he builds in Genesis 10, the rabbis look very uh, sourly at, at Nimrod. They call him um, uh, some kind of early dictator and enslaver. But in any case, uh, there, there's this indication that there's institutionalized force and, and violence that holds people together and God scatters the project. Um, from that point, God rebuilds the community of faith, protecting them from various forces. So Sodom and Gomorrah, Onan and Pharaoh. Sodom and Gomorrah are notorious for their exclusion and violence, despite being previously delivered by Abraham, right? In Genesis 14, God is with Abraham. Uh, Abraham actually uh, delivers all the people and the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah from this coalition of kings that has swooped in from the uh, Sumerian region. And that should have been remembered. Apparently it wasn't. So Sodom and Gomorrah pose a threat to uh, the, the future people of Israel as they, they settle and God rains fire on them. Uh, also, there's, what do I mean here? City-state tension is counteracted by sibling reconciliation. The, um, <clears throat> Ah, I mean, they are sometimes in a coalition at the Canaanite city-states, and sometimes they fight each other. So the model of what God does is, is to reconcile the 12 um, uh, sons of Jacob, and it, it's a model of sibling reconciliation. That's going to become 
important later because Israel is a witness, becomes a witness to the Canaanites. <clears throat> so the um, city-state tension, I, sorry, Onan is a son of Judah that tries to exclude Tamar from the family. Tamar is a Canaanite woman that uh, is married to one of the sons of Judah. And Onan doesn't want to um, perform the Leverite marriage, Leverite marriage uh, uh, role with Tamar because um, Tamar's husband dies. Onan is the brother-in-law of Tamar. You're supposed to, um, uh, the brother was supposed to marry the widow in some sense and raise up children for the widow in the name of the, the, bro the deceased brother and that widow. Onan doesn't want to do that because he's greedy. He's like, hey, I get more inheritance if I don't do that. So no. And for that, God actually takes his life. <laughs> that, that's really interesting because Tamar is playing the role of the Israelite there. The Israel, and, and even though she's ethnically Canaanite, that's really important as kind of a prelude to what we're going to talk about, God's relationship to the Canaanites. Tamar is ethnically Canaanite. Onan is a son of Judah who wants to exclude her from the family, but that would be at this point spiritual death. And so reciprocally, because of the exclusion, so reciprocally, God takes his life and Tamar, God includes her in the family. So that's an important data point to keep in mind. And then the next thing that God protects people from is Pharaoh. Pharaoh in Egypt, tries to kill and control God's firstborn. That title, God's firstborn son, is Israel. It belongs to Israel. And so uh, for that reason, God takes the firstborn of Egypt. He mirrors back to the Egyptians, and especially to Pharaoh, what they're doing to, to Israel and to God's plan. Because if you stop Israel, if you, if you kill Israel, then you're actually... Uh, stopping Jesus from coming. You're jeopardizing the redemption of human nature that God wants. So, and that would be suicide. So the, the you can get a flavor for what's going on as you, as you consider these instances. All right, so in the Sinai covenant, God took human life to protect Israel externally and also internally. So from external adversaries and also from internal, uh, I, I guess, threats. The people who, who either wanted to uh, steer Israel off course or betray Moses's leadership or the, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> too much of that would have led Israel into a place of betraying their vocation. It's, it's significant later that in 2 Corinthians 3, the last bullet point, Paul says, that the Sinai covenant was a covenant of death. And it was, <clears throat> it was an acceleration of the exile from the garden, right? We talked about this last time, I think, and, and maybe uh, before that, that the whole purpose of Israel was to be a microcosm of humanity living in the garden, but being exiled, and the exile results in our mortality, both in Genesis 3 and in the Sinai covenant. And this was, th this was really important to keep in mind because um, <laughs> that means when people die, when God took people's life, yes, it was an acceleration of what was happening, but everyone died, right? And so the phenomenon that we have to really wrestle with is death. What is human death? What is human mortality? Uh, Moses died, for instance, and God was even upset with him. But yet Moses shows up later next to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So, so it's not simply that, well, God took your life, um, that, that tells us everything. Um, actually, it, it tells us not very much. So we'll, we'll talk about that later. And uh, on the whole, again, the, the role of Israel was to uh, be a precursor to Jesus. We, we talked last time about Irenaeus, um, Macarius of Egypt, Cyril of Alexandria saying, Israel is like a medical focus group. And my language, language for that is like, they're, they're like a clinical trial in the best sense. 
that God is trying to help humanity, a subset of humanity, be a uh, cooperative patient. The rest of human beings are, are uncooperative uh, patients, even though we have this disease and God is trying to heal us. So the, the point of the Sinai Covenant is to serve, is to protect Israel like that. Now, but we get to passages like this. So in Joshua 6 and 8, and, and this, is, uh, this is why we're here, because we need to talk about things like this. We have the, this interaction between God and Israel on the one hand and the Canaanites on the other. It says this, they utterly destroyed everything in the city of Jericho, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. Later, at another battle, all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai, the second city. The third city is going to be Hazor. For Joshua did not withdraw his hand, with which he stretched out the javelin until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Well, that sounds really tough. I mean, <clears throat> um, is, is this genocide? That's one of the questions that we need to ask because of this phrasing of utterly destroying everybody, man and woman, adult child. Uh, we have horrific pictures uh, and experiences in the modern era and, and earlier of genocide. Uh, or was it holy war or a crusade or jihad of some sort? So <clears throat> again, there are pictures in our minds of the medieval period, uh, or even as recently as ISIS in the Middle East, where we are very concerned what is going on here. For people to claim that they are killing other people in the name of God, how do we receive that? How do we interpret that? Uh, how do we discuss that with people um, who, who believe it, who don't believe it? That's a big question. Also, in the United States, we have manifest destiny. The idea that, well, at first, Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and in particular, and then later, they included other uh, European ethnic groups like Italians, Irish, Germans, it, who were Catholics, into that uh, group of whiteness, uh, that w white people are destined to take control of the entire continent of North or, or from at least the Atlantic to the Pacific in some sense. And so these are pictures of um, that, that conquest and especially the displacement and massacre of Native Americans. So genocide, uh, holy war and manifest destiny all are modern uh, or relatively recent experiences that we are deeply concerned about. And it, it makes us think of the book of Joshua. Is that what is happening? So um, theologically, there's this problem, which is, well, th there, there isn't a problem if you think God could be arbitrary. So if you think of God's wrath and love being equal and op opposite attributes, then no, there's no problem here. God could do whatever God wants, right? So God can save some, and then God can destroy others. Now, that's usually talked about on the eternal level, but if in actual human history something like that happens, then there isn't a problem in terms of what is the character of God here? It's just asserted that God could do whatever God wants. But throughout this course, and, and also in the patristic era, there is a problem. We have to labor under the, uh, the, the declaration that God is loving and good. Why? Because he's Trinitarian. If God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, before he made anything, then love is what is going on in God at all times, especially before he makes stuff. And so out of his character, all of his actions flow. We talked about this when we uh, looked at Athanasius a few weeks ago. Deeds are that deeds flow from their natures, like in, in the deities, but also the human. So deeds correspond to their natures. That is an axiomatic principle. Okay, so let's get into it. There, there, there are different images that we have of the Battle of Jericho. <laughs> um, this one, the one on the left, is like Israel circling a town, like a medieval town. Uh, another is a little bit more accurate with walls. Uh, 
But in any case, this is what archaeology has concluded. All the archaeological evidence indicates that no civilian populations existed at Jericho, Ai, and other cities mentioned in Joshua. That is striking. No civilian population. That is to say, probably no women and children, and, and no elderly, for instance. According to the best calculations from Canaanite inscriptions and other archaeological evidence, that is, no artifacts or prestige ceramics indicating wealth or social status as one would expect in general population centers, Jericho was a small settlement of probably 100 or fewer soldiers. This is why all of Israel could circle it seven times and then do battle against it on the same day. Okay. Whoa. Wait, what? What's going on here? Uh, summary, Israel attacked military fortresses. There were no civilians and there were soldiers only. That's what I am going to assert here, that's corroborated by the archaeology, but what to make of the scripture then? Because scripture doesn't seem to describe it this way, as it says here, both man and woman, young and old. That sounds civilian. So <clears throat> why is that? Um, the patristic, I'm going to summarize a bunch of things. So um, early Christian authors they also felt uncomfortable with some of these stories. And so one of the ways in which they dealt with it was to say it's symbolic. They, some of them engaged in non-historical, non-literal exegesis. Now it's not that they had the tools of archeology span at their fingertips like we do today, but it, it's that they felt that something was um, hard to explain. Jesus says, love your enemies. So why is it here that God is commanding Israel to kill their enemies? And, and so their way of engaging with it was to say, this must be symbolic. Now, the precedent for that is, uh, well, Platonism and Philo of Alexandria. So their, Philo of Alexandria was a Hellenistic Jew who started interpreting Old Testament things symbolically. But we don't totally know whether he... Uh, he meant that it has no historic relevance or historic data, historical data in there, but he certainly did interpret it symbolically. There, uh, there were a few movements philosophically and literarily called, that we now call Middle Platonism and Neoplatonism, that, that was happening not in Jewish and Christian circles, but actually in Greek circles. And they felt some of the same things with relation to Homer. Because in Homer, like in his uh, Iliad and Odyssey, uh, you have gods doing mischievous things, sometimes cruel things, and, and it was believed that uh, gods, by this time, you know, hundreds of years after Homer, that gods, or at least uh, with the Platonist philosophers, gods shouldn't do that. That's, that's, that's evil. So what do we make of Homer? Because People love Homer. You can't just throw out his poetry out of the, the Greek canon of literature. So they reinterpreted Homer. They said, this must mean something else. Okay, so this culminates in a guy named Origen of Alexandria, who's a Christian, uh, a teacher at the school of Alexandria. And he says, yes, let's, let's apply that method to the Old Testament. So he calls that uh, anagogy or allegory or typology. It goes by different names, but essentially um, this, this means something else. Uh, it's not, it, it may be historical, but the significance is spiritual. Now, there is some precedence for this, like in the New Testament itself. The New Testament follows, it will, will take the book of Joshua, for example, and in the book of Hebrews and say, well, Joshua led the people into a, a kind of an attempt at rest in the garden land, but it wasn't the full rest. Jesus leads us into the full rest. So Jesus is like the true Joshua. And yes, that is, that is one way of doing it. And, um, it. and it's done by the New Testament itself. But there, there is an acknowledgement in the New Testament that, that there's an earlier history and then a later history. It's not that there was a literary story that get, gets interpreted figuratively. So, uh, and that follows a pattern in the Old Testament itself, right? In the Old Testament, 
uh, earlier stories are connected to later stories. And, and so you have in Genesis 1, the spirit hovering over the waters of creation. And that is echoed again in the spirit hovering over the waters of the flood. Why? Well, because it's a new creation. And Noah and his family are a kind of new humanity or a, a preliminary or an attempt at a new humanity. Uh, the ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat, which is a mountain, and life spreads out from there. What's that like? Eden, because Eden was a mountain, and life was supposed to spread out from there. So, so yeah, the Old Testament is already doing this. This is not unique to the New Testament. The New Testament is just saying, we observe this all the time. So that is, this is just how God works. And so the New Testament uses Israel's stories in this way. The idea is that stories are containers that are filled by later stories, or even modified somewhat by later stories, or amplified. Uh, but in any case, there's a connection between stories because this God works in patterns. Okay, so that, that, that gives you some, I, I want to give you a basis for understanding like why it is that Christians would, would interpret things symbolically, both because the New Testament already starts to do that, but um, the origins method is, I'll, I'll be frank, it troubles me uh, because at times he, he uh, is very willing to say this did not happen historically or this does not have a historical referent. You could ask me questions about that later. All right. Others, um, I, this is more modern. I, I, I'm not aware of any patristic authors who would say this, but others would say it's erroneous, right? The entire book of Joshua, for instance, or, or at least substantial portions of it, it's erroneous. Either, either there's a lot of human error involved, like Israel misheard God or misinterpreted God, like maybe they weren't supposed to go to battle, or that God was an error. And I mean, I suppose it's possible to argue this, but the, the argument is made that Jesus did not quote from these episodes. What does that mean? Uh, if, if Jesus is the kind of final authority on scripture, then, well, maybe it's possible to say something about that. And, and it was, it's implied that this material, like the book of Joshua, is so inferior, it's, it's ignorable. Or simply that God was wrong, and, you know, this God is malicious, so therefore... Um, or, or if you are in the, well, I suppose the high federal Calvinist camp and you think God can do both evil and good, then I, it's, it's, uh, not a divine error. It's actually just how it is, but we don't, we don't like it. Um, are there other possibilities? So, um, let, I'm going to kind of do a quick, uh, dive into other ancient Near Eastern literature. And we're gonna, we are gonna circle back around into patristic commentary on this, but uh, uh, hang with me on this. In, to, in today's language, uh, like, was it just a few nights ago, I think that the Celtics beat the uh, Golden State Warriors <laughs> in game one of the NBA finals. Like, what do you hear? You, you hear a lot of language like we kicked their butts, we slaughtered them, uh, we, we came from behind and just like killed them. Uh, we wiped the floor with them. We beat them down so hard they're never going to get up. Like maybe not this past game, but this is what sports fans say all the time. And uh, maybe sometimes crude military historians will say that. But the, this type of thing teaches us that uh, language of victory is often hyperbolic, both now and then. And so in the ancient world, this is what this is how people talked. Egypt's Thutmosis III in the later 15th century BC boasted that the numerous army of Mitanni was overthrown within the hour, annihilated totally, like those now non-existent. Okay, notice the language. We annihilated them totally. They don't exist anymore. But in reality, the forces of Mitanni lived on to fight in the 15th and 14th centuries BC. Hmm. Uh, here's another one in, in Egypt. Uh, the entire force, all the chiefs of all the countries were chaff. Uh, Israel, oh, this is really interesting. Uh, Ramsey's son, Mernepta, announced Israel has wa is wasted, his seed is not. That was premature, right? Because Israel lived on. 
But nevertheless, this is the way they talk about battles. Uh, the mountains are empty of people, blah, blah, blah. Here's other ones. Another one. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel has utterly perished for always. Wow. For always. That, that's a long time. <laughs> so, and, and then he boasted of killing women and girls. So, but that, oh, well, it's certainly not true that perished for always. In any, in any case, you get the idea. Hyperbolic victory language is common throughout the ancient Near East. And so Joshua in the, actually uses that. So in Joshua 10, he left no survivor, but he utter, utterly destroyed all who breathed just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Dot, dot, dot. And in Joshua 11, there were no Anakim left. Okay, so how do I know that's hyperbolic victory language? Why is that not literal? Well, because of this. Because in Joshua 14, uh, someone says to Joshua, now then give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that Anakim were there with great fortified cities. I will drive them out as the Lord had spoken. Really? So, wait, so they're still there. I mean, the Anakim can't be both gone and still there at the same time, right? In an in a actual physical historical sense. Uh, so here's another one and at the end of the book of Joshua for if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations these which remain among you and intermarry with them so that you associate with them and they with you know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive out these nations da, da, da. so wait a minute a lot of people are still there <clears throat> uh, in fact Throughout the book of Joshua, there is ongoing coexistence indicated. So Joshua was old and advanced in years, uh, and very much of the land remains to be possessed. Joshua 16, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Israel. Joshua 17, but the sons of Manasseh could not take possession of the cities because the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. So notice, God's original command was to utterly destroy them. And then... Uh, in the very, okay, I want to point out where this is. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1 and 2. Okay, that's in Deuteronomy 7. In verse 3, in verse 3, like the very next verse, God and Moses warn Israel against assimilation. That implies that, uh, that the Canaanites are going to be around, at least for a while, right? Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them, dot, 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 dot. You're going to observe their culture, their worship practices. Um, don't follow them. So, I mean, it's I, there's a tension here. Uh, how quickly did uh, was Israel supposed to engage them militarily and and defeat them? Well, because it sounds like uh, it was supposed to last a long time. And in fact, when we think about this peaceful displacement, this vision of peaceful displacement. Uh, I think it, well, I mean, it leans more towards the latter, like there's this gradual settlement and displacement. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, and houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied. Uh, that would take a long time, <clears throat> actually. And, and so the idea here is what makes you a brilliant communicator in one culture is precisely what makes you hard to understand in another. So when we look at the cultural historical context, and again, this is more in the realm of biblical studies today, we have to consider that idiomatic phrases have to, should be translated idea for idea, not simply word for word. So here's this example. How would you translate this into another language and culture? In English, I could say, I spilled the beans, I let the cat out of the bag, my mom hit the ceiling. Now, if you're an English speaker in the US, you probably know exactly what I mean. I, I let out a secret and my mom was upset. But I said it in a certain way. If you did the translation into uh, another language, word for word, that would, that would just be incomprehensible. The idea here is <laughs> that, look, if we give ourselves permission to speak in a certain way, then we really should give other people permission to speak in those ways too. 
right? In, including the ancients, including um, those in the biblical text, the human authors. And, and further, so it's not just the cultural historical context, it's also the literary context. We have to look at whole books of scripture, like the entire book of Joshua, not just take sound bites or little clips or treat scripture as a bunch of slideshows, like, well, here's one chapter or one verse. We have to look at the book of Joshua as a movie. We have to watch the whole thing and then evaluate what's going on. And once we do that, we see things like, okay, Israel accepted surrender and defection. For instance, in Joshua 6, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared. And she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now, uh, they, uh, it is believed by archaeologists that, uh, yes, in military fortresses, there are sometimes taverns run by a family or a brothel. It, I mean, it, it's actually, this is a longer story, but it's possible that Rahab was not actually a harlot. <laughs> this word takes on the meaning because of kind of a retrospective look. In any case, it's compatible with the idea that Jericho was a military fortress and that therefore, as really the only civilians, they had a vested interest in, in defecting and surrendering to Israel and then joining Israel. Uh, here's another example. This is really, really uh, significant. The Hivites living, living in Gibeon, they all surrendered and they made peace with the sons of Israel. Uh, they, and then the, the rest, they took them all in battle. So it, this verse shows that Israel regularly uh, offered terms of surrender. So that's important because it shows that it is not genocide. Okay, this was not about the Canaanites' ethnicity. In fact, uh, look at the whole uh, picture of, of the Old Testament. And this is what we see in Genesis 38. Judah, one of the sons of Jacob, married Shua, a Canaanite woman. Tamar married one of Judah's sons and gave birth to Judah's children, which is a grisly story, but okay. Uh, she was incorporated into the family of Israel and defended by God. Remember Onan? Like Onan tried to exclude her. At this point in Israel's history, that type of exclusion is, is a type of spiritual death. And so it got in, uh, mirrored the, the consequence back to Onan. What Onan was doing was spiritual death or trying to inflict it on Tamar. What God did was reversed it. Shaul in Exodus 6.15, there's a mixed multitude that joined Israel. Caleb is a Canaanite. Caleb is one of Moses's two lieutenants. Like he's up there with Joshua, right? Like they're the top two guys in Israel. And so uh, in Numbers 32, 12, you also want to look at uh, Genesis 15 there, but Caleb is a Kenizzite. That is a Canaanite tribe. Rahab in Joshua 6, we just read about her. She became an ancestor of Jesus. And all these, all the Hivites, they're incorporated, and then the other Canaanites try to attack them, and God says to Israel, defend them, defend them, and so they became part of Israel, and they actually became servants of the sanctuary. They uh, cut wood, they transported things, they, they helped the, the Levites carry stuff, and uh, it's, it's fascinating. So anyway, Jericho, Ai, and Hazor, the, the three cities that uh, the Israelites attacked in the book of Joshua, appear to be a controlled operation to cut the nerve of the Canaanites' military power. So Israel's terms, if we were to summarize them, God did not command Israel to kill all the Canaanites. Israel was open to accepting Canaanites through conversion, and, and Israel was rejecting certain beliefs and practices that the Canaanites held. So what were they? Um, so, uh, if there are some biblical sources and then extra biblical sources that I'll just go through. Attacking Israel at its most vulnerable. So there are multiple places where they did that. Forced enslavement in Numbers 21. Rape to express dominance over strangers and conquered peoples. So using rape as a uh, military tool or uh, it, 
that's as egregious uh, now as it was then. And incest, bearing children through incest, that's alluded, or that's uh, described in Leviticus 18. Uh, human sacrifices and a cult of sex. This is William Albright, who is an archaeologist uh, looking at Canaanite, what we could tell about Canaanite civilization through archaeology. You could read that later. And probably most serious is child sacrifice. So they, they worship Molech. Um, and there are three sources that by which we can reasonably say that yes, the Canaanite did, did practice child sacrifice on some pretty widespread level. Uh, archaeology, literature, um, well, I'm sorry, archaeology and literature. And then you could look at Appendix A where I list out all those sources. So the, the question here is, how would a defeated or declining uh, child sacrificing people try to avenge themselves? That is a troubling thought, because if you, if you believe that, uh, you know, the reason why you are not as victorious and successful as you would like is that you didn't sacrifice enough of your own children, then that really is self-destructive and self-mutilating. In, term, in a communal sense. So the parallel here would be, how would a people stuck in a culture of gang violence and self-mutilation respond to an outside threat? Right, if, if in your mind, the story you're telling yourself is, uh, we, we better um, mutilate ourselves in order to win. Well, <clears throat> so the, the bigger picture, as if we were to back up, is that we have, um, we have to consider, okay, how do we expect a God, uh, not just the God revealed in Jesus, but any God, to engage with or be related to human evil? And I think there's, you know, some basic choices that we looked at last time. You can have a God that causes human evil. You can have a God who ignores human evil, or you can have a God who limits human evil in some sense. So, I mean, that's a basic choice. <clears throat> the well what kind so so clearly the god portrayed and narrated in scripture is is limiting human evil in some sense now that does what does that mean though did god consign the canaanites to hell no so in first peter 4 6 peter says that jesus pursued people into the grave for the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. And then briefly, he says earlier, he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, meaning uh, Sheol in Hebrew or Hades in Greek, the, the realm of the dead. And this we uh, this is attested to in the Apostles' Creed, which is a decentralized, spontaneous development taking place across the, the church. It uses the baptism formula of Matthew 28, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it just ex it, it inserts key phrases into there, and, uh, presumably to fill out the narrative. And um, one of those phrases is, he descended to the dead. So that's referring to Jesus between... Uh, between his death and resurrection, what, what many churches call Holy Saturday. Uh, that's what he did. Uh, the Athanasian Creed, which is not, uh, uh, I don't think it was actually written by Athanasius. It's just attributed to him um, because it follows his line of thinking. It was used in the West. It might have been Hilary of Poitiers who helped to get this rolling. But he says, it descent, he descended into hell. And, and again, how they're meaning Hades or Sheol. So this is very common across the fourth and fifth century. But again, this is really important because uh, it's liturgical material. The church loves and, and stabilizes liturgical material. And here is iconography. So y'all know this is one of my favorite um, uh, pieces of early Christian art. It's called the Anastasis, and uh, it depicts what uh, we believe happened on Holy Saturday. Jesus bursting down the doors to Sheol. Underneath his feet are the doors and the bones and locks and keys that are just broken. And he's entering the realm of the dead and pulling Adam and Eve up from the grave. Uh, if you want to see 
early church commentary on this. You could look at uh, Metropolitan Hilarion Alpha of Christ, the Conqueror of Hell. And there's so many uh, citations and, and quotes and engagement with this idea. The, what this affirms is that God hit a pause button on people's lives until Jesus presented himself to them. So in then building out of the analogy of God needing a medical focus group called Israel, like in this whole context, the, the whole creation has now become God's hospital. And there's a part of it that is a coma ward. <laughs> I, 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 it's a little crude, but basically God says, I need to keep you in stasis, put you in a coma until I revive you and give you a chance to meet Jesus. And then you get to decide. That's the idea of what's happening with Hades or Sheol. And that's the idea of what's happening with the Canaanites and many others. Well, pretty much all others who died before Jesus died. So we also have to consider that God reached out to the Canaanites beforehand many times and in many ways. So you have Noah, the grandfather of Canaan. Uh, you have God scattering Babel or Babel. You have, and, and these things are significant because <clears throat> Noah is warning his whole family of, and especially Canaan, he's describing a curse. He's not prescribing a curse. He's describing it. Uh, God is also protecting the weakest among humanity because any empire-like structure has people at the top, a few, and people at the bottom. Many, Canaan was probably, or the Canaanites were probably at the bottom. Abraham and Sarah uh, lived for a long time in the midst of the Canaanites, including rescuing Sodom and Gomorrah. Melchizedek was a Canaanite. Uh, he was a priest and a king of Salem or Jerusalem. That was the, the uh, early version of Jerusalem. And Abraham and Melchizedek had this relationship. Melchizedek seemed to worship God in some way that Abraham said was valid. Then there is 400 years of patience with the Amorites and other Canaanites. Uh, that Genesis 15 mentions. There's a warning given by Sodom and Gomorrah and how God dealt with them. Isaac and Rebekah are also witnesses to the Canaanites around them. Jacob and his family, which included the marriage of Judah and Shua, Judah's son to Tamar, and Tamar's children by Judah. Presumably all of Jacob's children, except for Joseph, actually marry Canaanites. So again, this is not ethnic. Uh, and, and then Joseph saves everybody in the ancient Near East, including Canaanites from a famine. Uh, in addition, there's probably some Canaanites involved in the mixed multitude that left with Israel out of Egypt. And then for 40 years, God broadcasted his power uh, to the land of Canaan. And the word travels fast. Rahab had heard, and Rahab and the Hivites both knew uh, Israel's story and what the God of Israel was claiming, and so they defected and they joined Israel. And then, on top of that, Canaanites coexisted with Israel for a long time. So, I don't know if Paul in Romans two four is thinking about this necessarily, but there there is a there is a, a principle that he's summarizing: the kindness of God leads us to repentance, and and that gets us into uh, the. the a little bit more of the literary context. So now, um, when we look at the book of Joshua as a whole, and we start to build all these pieces in, what do we see? <clears throat> okay, so the Hivites in Joshua 9 through 11 became part of Israel. That is remarkable on its own. They became servants of the sanctuary, like I said. Israel defended them from other Canaanites. And what's important from a literary context is that Joshua 9 through 11 is the climax of the book of Joshua. After Joshua 11, I mean, after, you know, from 12 to 24, the book is exceedingly boring and it's just a list of, you know, how land got a portion. <laughs> so, so Joshua 9 through 11 is really the high point of the action. Everything else is kind of the, the outworking or the, uh, the, you know, the results that flow from it. Uh, that's really important, really important. That That is indicating that the whole point of the book of Joshua is 
openness to Canaanites, to the Canaanites joining Israel, to be invited in and saying yes. Okay, that's echoed again in the, the book of the 12 minor prophets. I know that as Protestants, we like to look at uh, what Hosea, Amos, Joel, and so on as like each, they each are their own book. I'm following the Jewish understanding of the 12 minor prophets. They're regarded as one book. And in that one book, conversion is interpreted as enemies destroyed. So look at Edomites in the book of, in this book of the 12. They are discussed in Amos and Obadiah, uh, books that are right next to each other. At the end of the book of Amos, God says the Edomites will be incorporated under Davidic rule. And then in the book of Obadiah, it says, Obadiah says the Edomites will be destroyed. And that, and, and that's how Obadiah opens. So in other words, within just a few verses, someone who organized the canon and organized the 12 is saying, you need to read Amos and Obadiah together because there's a hinge connector. That hinge connector is the Edomites. The Edomites are going to be incorporated and that constitutes this destruction. So it could be that Obadiah prophesied destruction of the Edomites. That if you just took o Obadiah alone, that's what it sounds like. But guess what? Whoever put the Bible together put Amos right before Obadiah. And that, <laughs> I know it's this is bizarre, but it means that the, the, the way the Edomites will actually be destroyed is by being incorporated under the house of David. Okay, isn't that amazing? Am I just making this up? No. How do I know that? Because in Acts 15, that's how the apostles read Amos 9, verse 12. They take the Edomites, that passage, and say, yeah, that's happening to all the Gentiles. And the, the apostles were in the habit of saying to Gentile Christians, you are no longer Gentiles. In Ephesians 4 or 1 Corinthians 10, th these are just examples. I know we today are more in the habit of saying Gentile Christian, Jewish Christian. Uh, I am a Japanese American Christian and so on. And so we compound adjectives and descriptors and identities, I guess. But the, that is not the way the, um, the, the early Christians talked. They thought of Christian as like a third race, not Jewish or Gentile. And, and so the idea is that, um, how does God destroy his enemies? Well, by converting them, right? And, and when, you, when people convert in, into the family of faith, they're, they're, they are no longer enemies. The enemy has been destroyed. So that is a, that is a true idea. Uh, then we look at the canonical context. Okay, so we, we looked at the literary context in which some of these things happen. The canonical context is, yeah, Jesus went to the Canaanites. So here's the Canaanite woman story. Uh, and, and then this is the first Peter, Jesus descending to the dead um, insight. Now, <clears throat> in Matthew 15, Jesus goes to this Canaanite woman this, during his earthly ministry. And Hilary of Poitiers, who is in modern day France at around the time of the mid to late um, fourth century, so the somewhere like 350 uh, onward, uh, commented on Matthew 15 and the story of Jesus uh, meeting the Canaanite woman. And, and this is a this is a good example of the, the mainstream view of how Christians interpreted the Old Testament and especially the Canaanites. The, um, and again, I compare this with uh, Origen's view, which is the, that it's mainly symbolic, maybe perhaps entirely symbolic, um, or the modern view where we say things like, um, there was human error or divine error. Well, you know, that's not what the majority of early Christians said. And this is a good example. 
there is a firm belief that there was and still is in Israel a community of proselytes or converts who passed over from the Gentiles into the works of the law. The Canaanites were inhabiting the lands of present day Judea, whether absorbed by war or dispersed to neighboring places or brought into servitude as a vanquished people. They carried about their name, but lacked a native land. Intermingled with the Jews, therefore, these people came from the Gentiles. And since a portion of those among the crowds who believed were proselytes, this Canaanite woman most likely had left her territory preferring the status of a proselyte. That is, coming out from the Gentiles to the community of a neighboring people. She was appealing on behalf of her daughter, who was a type or a, an archetype for all the Gentile people. And since she knew the Lord from the law, she addressed him as son of David. For in the law, the king of the eternal and heavenly kingdom is referred to as the rod out of the stem of Jesse and the son of David. Wow, that's pretty cool. So when we think about this, I, this is a map that I've, many of us probably have in our Bibles, uh, which is called the conquest of Canaan. I mean, sure, there, there is a conquest happening related to Jericho and, Haz and, and Hazor, the military fortresses. But it, it, it is fair to, to also call this the settlement of Canaan and even the invitation to Canaan. So summarizing this, God's goal is to protect Israel and Jesus because Jesus needs to become, uh, or Jesus needs to come as truly human and therefore truly vulnerable as a human being and, and needing a human community. If he needs a physical human community in which to be born, then he needs a land to be born into. And, and so God's goal also is to symbolize um, a garden home for Israel. There is no further uh, land conquest, right? So, so Israel does not become imperial. Uh, as it relates to Can Canaan and the Canaanites, God's goal is for, the, for Israel to occupy a land that was becoming vacant. They were to bear close personal witness to a people who were self-destructive and invite them in and to demonstrate a counterculture. Now, there were some aspects of Canaanite evil that needed to be checked. So they're, they're real and troubling. It threatened Israel and threatened their own, uh, the Canaanites' own children and their own survival. So you know, there were terms of battle for these three uh, battles, and, and there were others, uh, but, but essentially followed this pattern. Israel did not actually kill women and children. It was a precise campaign against military fortresses. It was not ethnic. It was about geography in a limited sense, and it's about faith. So conversion and incorporation were welcomed. The cost of the battle, yes, there was a cost of the battle. People died. But combatants were not consigned to hell. They were held in a coma ward until Jesus awakened them and presented himself to them. So when it comes to the character of God, we can still say God desires each person to be healed and transformed through Jesus. We have to work harder to think it through, but fundamentally, I think it's consistent. Um, and this is consistent with the early church assessment of Israel as a medical focus group anticipating a cure. We looked at those quotes last time. Irenaeus, Gregor, Gregory of Nazianzus, Macarius of Egypt, and Cyril of Alexandria all describe Israel as um, having a partial cure. Jesus is the full cure. Israel had a partial cure. And you could look at last week's session if you want to see that a bit more. Uh, the, the, the lessons for biblical theology is we need to study the themes uh, traced through the biblical narrative, and systematic theology is to uh, integrate God's character around Christ. We can incorporate the entirety of the biblical data. So saying this a bit more, and, and forgive me, I'm just going to belabor this, but there's cultural historical context, there's literary context, and then there's canonical context. So idea for idea, not just word for word. It's not random, but it's uh, we're not making these words mean anything we want. It, it is actually controlled by the historical context or at least influenced by it. And then when we take the literary context, we look at the entire book of Joshua. What does that say? It says Canaanites are welcome. What does the book of 12 say? 
the book of the 12 minor prophets, it says Gentiles conversion are welcome. Israelites are not the good guys per se, or no matter what, it's that uh, I mean, they have the same human nature problem as everyone else. And so it, it's not that whatever they do, God backs them. But God did want Israel to be a witness to the Canaanites. So that does appear to be their function. And so in the whole canon of scripture, how does the New Testament treat it? Well, we see it. We see Jesus reaching out to the Canaanite woman, uh, pursuing all those who died before he died. Really fascinating. Now, from a systematic theology standpoint, how do we understand the character of God? Again, well, if you think God is arbitrary and can just do evil and good, and it doesn't make a difference to him, then sure, you have no problem. The, the greater challenge is for those of us who, says, who say God is loving to the core, and he is always good to, or ultimately good to everyone. That is... <clears throat> That's the early patristic paradigm, and we can say, yeah, God in Christ offers the new humanity of Christ to everyone. That is still the baseline. Okay, so discussion. Um, I went a long time, and uh, 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 thanks for bearing with that. Uh, again, there, that builds a lot on material that we've covered before in terms of the early church, but it's now incorporating uh, some other tools of biblical studies. I would love to have you, um, you know, discuss some of these things. So here are the three questions. I think I already popped them into the chat. Uh, what was the purpose of the battles? What was its limit? I just want to see whether you're listening. Why did God place the Israelites in their midst? And what questions does this leave you with? There could be more. Okay, so Ian or Biota, if you could open up the Zoom breakouts and, and send us into there for, uh, let's do seven minutes. Uh, is Israel an empire or anti-empire? This relates again to, at least in the ancient world, to, to the issue of canonization because, and, and, and also to our modern suspicions of those in control control the literature. Like, is that what's happening in Israel? Uh, should we be concerned? Well, I think it's good to be concerned, uh, but he, here's how I've thought through it. Um, again, the, the relevance of empire and canonization, who writes the history, who's invested in keeping the history, what's the history for, um, there, there's a general, general sociological pattern out there, which is that the powerful are the literate, right? And so we, we, we should actually ask those questions of the Old Testament. We know remarkably little about the canonization of the Old Testament. Um, we know just by the time that Jesus arrives on the scene that uh, that has stabilized mostly, right? And, and the Greek Septuagint uh, took for granted that there was a core, and they translated from Hebrew to Greek all of those core books. Um, but here's something really important to keep in mind. When we're asking what is God's goal for scripture itself, and by scripture I mean the Hebrew scriptures, if it's to be a medical spiritual diagnosis, then God's goal must be to have the maximum possible conviction among people. Because this relates to how many future partners will Jesus have. So it is not simply to, God's goal is not simply to preserve the documents by like a few people and have just a few, you know, fragments or, or books that are available for someone to discover, to say like, oh, look, like these ideas, they were around. The, the idea of... Um, Israel being a medical focus group requires there to be um, widespread literacy, right? Because it serves the mission and it counteracts empire tendencies. Uh, again, empires tend to consolidate literary skills and, and actual literature itself because they want to control their imperial narrative. Now, if you, and, and this has huge sociological effects. If you, if you want a really good, a closer to modern day example, look at Robert Woodbury's article, The Missionary Roots of Liberal Democracy, where 
He published it in the American Political Science Review in May of 2012, which is the leading journal of political science. And <clears throat> basically his argument is uh, Protestant missionaries really focused on literacy. And, and there were so many positive effects of that. It was just amazing. Um, in some cases, you know, women and children were trained to be literate. In some cases, uh, entire cultures did not have a literary uh, alphabet or they did not have an alphabet. They had an oral tradition and a, 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 an oral language, but not a written one. And so what's the impact of transcribing it? Like there are some huge positive benefits, which he just kind of rolls up and says, this is an aspect of liberal, it becomes uh, possible to have liberal democracy. And there's a particular one that I like, geopolitics and empire, which I listed here for you later. In Israel, there is definitely an explicit critique of empire. Israel claimed that empires had sinful origins, starting with Cain's city called Enoch in Genesis 4 and Nimrod's city called Babel in Genesis 11. So Genesis 1 through 11, archetypal, you know, you know origin stories. Uh, empire, it's bad. <laughs> we don't want to do that. So, and then Israel escaped an empire, right? That's Pharaoh in Egypt. And, and the symbolism of the serpent on Pharaoh's crown and staff and the venom uh, in the wilderness in Numbers 21, echoing the serpent in the garden. I mean, that's really fascinating. You could go on for uh, a long time about that symbolism. But uh, that shows like, Israel didn't see this just as a coincidence, like that there's something uh, sinister and even satanic about empires and how they try to at least control uh, the people of God. And so Israel hopes for deliverance from empires, Isaiah and Daniel in particular. And so uh, Isaiah is amazing because the suffering servant is kind of the pivotal figure who delivers Israel from empires. There is deliverance from Babylon in Isaiah 13 to 14, kind of the primal uh, empire, but not just in a triumphalistic way. Somehow that is tied to the conversion of Assyria and Egypt in Isaiah 19 and 20. So Isaiah is already saying that, no, God's heart is for everyone to come to, come to Jesus. I mean, that's an anachronism. Come, come under the, the influence of the suffering servant. And... Um, and it's not simply that <clears throat> Israel takes over other people, right? Like Assyria is still its own nation. Egypt is still its own nation and they're blessed by God. And they're, they're equal, says Isaiah. They, become, they will become equal with Israel. That is amazing. Uh, this is a counter imperial vision. And then Daniel is the ultimate where the son of man rises above the deformed beasts and the deformed beasts represent the Gentile empires in Daniel 7. Uh, that's a reflection on Genesis 1 where the violations of animals from the creation order is, is what Daniel is stressing. Like, look, beasts should not look this way. They should not have these mixed body parts. That's a violation of Genesis 1. And so, <clears throat> so that's a major theme. Uh, also, Israel is anti-imperial in the sense that they incorporate converts. So we saw a bunch of them um, just now. So there was conversion into a multi-ethnic faith, especially of the Canaanites, but also many Egyptians, probably Amorites, uh, Hittites, and so on from Exodus 12. Uh, the Hivites became servants of the sanctuary, and they were eligible for intermarriage, which is the most intimate kind of union. Um, they also were given equal rights for as foreigners, strangers, and aliens in Leviticus 19 and 22. That's really important because compare that to other regimes. In the Roman Republic, they granted citizenship to all the free people of Italy, but only slowly and for the most part under duress because they were pressured to. The nobles never really accepted other Italians as equals. That's really significant. But look at Caleb, right? Again, one of the right-hand men of uh, Moses, Caleb and Joshua. He was a Canaanite. How does he get there? <laughs> so uh, Athens, Metikos, was any Athenian wanting residence in Athens while having no citizen rights of which Athenians were very jealous. They jealously guarded their citizenship 
they did have access to the courts, but they were unable to own property, so they were always lodgers, had to serve in the military, pay a medic tax, and if they became wealthy, were liable for the taxes on the rich, so <laughs> they were clearly second-class citizens. <clears throat> and here's the U.S. In, in under the last uh, uh, presidential administration. Give me your tired and your poor who can stand on their own two feet and who will not become a public charge, said Ken Cuccinelli, who was acting head of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service in 2019. Like, we'll only accept people if you're not going to get social services. <laughs> that, I mean, that is an attitude. So compare that with what happened with Israel. They welcomed converts. Also, in empires, there is internal hierarchy. Think Confucius, right? Like, but in Israel, there is not a hierarchy. There, there's a total challenge. And we talked about this in session two when we talked about women being leaders in the community. In order for women to lead in the community, the broad community, there, there needs to be at least two things that happen. Number one, the wife has to be equal to the husband in marriage. And we saw that in Irenaeus and John Chrysostom. And also, a, a, a new married couple has to be equal to their parents. Okay, it, there, there, there can't be like this hierarchy of the old over the young. Otherwise, how, how would a younger husband or wife be able to lead in community? In order for a woman to lead in the community, both these things had to happen, and that was Genesis 2, right? I mean, same things, uh, or same passage. And so women can teach and lead the community as in these, we find in these scriptures. Uh, mothers teaching their children, Proverbs 1, elders, judges, and prophetesses, and teachers of scripture, as we find in Deborah and Hulda, and then they even become sources of scripture. For example, Rebecca, Deborah, uh, Hannah, and then King Lemuel's mother in Proverbs 31. Once you're a, the human source of scripture, <laughs> I think that's pretty compelling. How are you not going to uh, be able to interpret what you just said to men or to the rest of the community? Like, no, you have to be equal. So <clears throat> also in a non-hierarchical sense, you have the vulnerability of women being acknowledged. There's this really interesting case in the state of Israel called Cohen v. State of Israel in 1981, where Jewish law acknowledged that uh, the J Jewish tradition and law uh, recognized that there was such a thing as marital rape, like a husband can rape his wife legally, but it's morally wrong and he should not do it. And here, there's all these reasons why. That's really important because until the 70s and 80s, in the UK and the US, there was no such thing. There was no, there was no acknowledgement that a husband could rape his wife. Uh, the, the assumption was that once a woman says yes at the altar, she says yes to every single time, including if the husband is estranged or has venereal disease or uh, wants to get her pregnant and she doesn't want to be pregnant, all these things. And that was rooted in the rights of wives in Exodus 21 and <laughs> early Me Too movement in Deuteronomy 22. I don't have time to explain that, but you get the idea. <clears throat> there was the distribution of land in Israel. That also flattened things, it led to uh, anti-imperial distributed power structure in Israel. Because once you have productive economic power distributed fairly equally, um, then you have less likelihood that one clan or one family is going to tyrannize another. So there was already no ter territorial expansion. Uh, God said, "It's this is your land and no further. There were also limits on Hebrew abed servanthood, which we talked about in session one. Uh, and also Jubilee. The Jubilee principle in Israel was uh, to, to reset the family land arrangements. And God pressed this economic reset button every 50 years and said, you're all my kids. I'm going to re-gift the garden land to all of you. Now, there was a jubilee in Egypt, and uh, I, I'm doing a little more reading in other places as well. But in Egypt, this is what the jubilee meant. After 30 years on the throne, the pharaoh celebrated a jubilee intended magically to rejuvenate the divine yet vulnerable monarch. So in other words, you, if you're a commoner, you bring a whole bunch of like grain and other things 
to the palace and give it to Pharaoh. And it's meant to prolong his life. That's Jubilee in Egypt. Okay, it's centralized. It's for the, the powerful and the most powerful guy and his friends and family. And in Israel, it's the opposite. It's God saying, I give you life. I don't suck your life from you. I give you life. <laughs> I distribute the land back to you. This is the basis of your life. Who invented that? Right? Um, and then in the kingship, yeah. Uh, the most powerful institution back then because of its military power, you have uh, checks and balances where there's separation of powers. In particular, an independent judiciary uh, where Rabbi Dr. Warren Goldstein talks about this Jewish law invented separation of powers. You have the prophets being basically an independent media source, right? No one can control them. And then you have the Levites and the priests, they teach, they are the independent judiciary sometimes. And then there's like elders in every village. So the, they're independent. The king does not have a monopoly of political power. The king can be sued as a litigant in a civil case. The king can be criminally prosecuted for any infraction of Jewish law. Any executive order or legislative act of the monarchy that is in conflict with the dictates of the constitution and legal system of Jewish law is automatically void. And the king could be impeached by the great Sanhedrin and removed from office. What? <laughs> so uh, it is incredible. Uh, compare that with what President Trump said. I have the absolute authority to do what I want with the Department of Justice. Oh, see, that wasn't even, that was not the case in Judaism. Among Israel's neighbors, um, it, and comparison point, kings had a sacral or even a divine status putting them above accountability. That was not true in Judaism. You have the, all these early warnings, God delays in instituting the kingship even. There's a critique when the kingship is instituted. Samuel and Chronicles, I'll just mention in Samuel, the book of Samuel is a reversal of the book of Genesis. In Genesis, you have fathers blessing sons, ultimately. In Samuel, you have fathers cursing their sons. In Genesis, you have Israel being a pilgrim uh, people. In Samuel, you have Israel settling. Uh, there's all these reversals of Genesis in the book of Samuel, which says you're going backwards. And in Chronicles, this, which is the most pro-David book of the Bible, you have David being described as the man of blood. He can't build the temple because of that. Instead, the king is supposed to be a scribe and a worship leader. That's what the king is supposed to be as a true Israelite, not as divine, but as a, a, the, the leading human. Um, and so again, scripture has this purpose where God wants the most possible uh, the, uh, uh, partners for Jesus. He wants the maximum possible conviction. He's not simply interested in preserving the documents with like this elite cadre of people at the top. And why is that? Because Jesus will come and he's gonna call everybody into mission. All right, so who preserved this? Who was invested? Um, I'll just skip over that. This is how God turned a people of the land into a people of the book. And that's really important. Not just a people with a book, but a people of the book, a people who lived their life by a book, who interpreted themselves by the story. You, you had widespread buy-in. That's really amazing. And so by the time of uh, Jesus, you have Jesus saying this, the scripture is fulfilled, or the scripture is filled to the full. And you've heard it said, but I tell you this. I, I mean, that's remarkable. And then a conviction that the scripture cannot be broken. You have Paul running around in Acts, talking to synagogue, saying the scripture was fulfilled. And, and that by itself was supposed to produce Christian disciples that were willing to lay their lives down for Jesus, sharing Jesus with their enemies, the Roman Empire. That's the kind of like significance it has. That is what God did transitioning a people of the land to a people of the book. And so the canonization of the Old Testament is just amazing. Despite the violence, which was threatening Israel from the outside, and also to some degree threatening Israel from the inside, even to the point where God is like, 
you know, I want you to be living among the violent people, the Canaanites. I want you to be living between violent people, the Nile River and the Tigris Euphrates River right there. You're in the crosshairs of empire. Everyone is going to march through your backyard trying to get to the other guy, but I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect you from the violence of that, that you want to do as well. Why? Again, because God intended Israel to be this medical focus group, to be partners for Jesus. And as it relates to the Canaanites, they, as they hoped for the cure, they were inviting the Canaanites into the group. They were practicing. They were practicing the mission. All right, let me stop there. What are your thoughts, friends? I'll start. Um, my thought is it's just a, a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of information to, to break down and think through. And um, I think Elliot kind of was saying this in, in our little breakout session, just it's kind of, it's a big aha moment. And for me, it's that in a sense of having read the Old Testament and just being really confused by the, what seemed like excessive violence. Um, and how that could be consistent with who God is. This is opening a door to understand that. Better. And I'm just really looking forward to trying to unpack it and appreciate this jump start. <laughs> Great jump start. Thanks, Cecilia. It, it's a lot to process. Thanks for hanging with that, especially if you know if you're hearing some of these things for the first time. Yeah, it's a lot. Any uh, pushback or, or questions that you raised in your Zoom breakout times that, that you want to discuss here? Oh, all right. It's all settled. No, I mean, I, I understand that there's a because there's so much to process, you, you do need to let this settle. The questions will emerge. Um, I, I didn't tackle them all. You should definitely read through the Old Testament again with, with a view to what is God doing, both among the Israelites and also to prepare everyone for Christ. So... Um, we can hang out a little bit more. I'll just say what's coming up next uh, in, in the uh, next week. It is a look at politics, the church, and, and the mission of Jesus. And in particular, applying a restorative justice paradigm, an anti-imperial paradigm, into um, the, the work of the church. Some of this, uh, you know, you have... You're, you're now seeing, okay, if empire was something that Israel was concerned about and it critiqued, then <clears throat> what are we to learn from that? And to what degree can we take that whole story, not just an isolated Bible verse here and there, but the whole experience of Israel and uh, respond to some of the things that we're facing today. So is there a paradigm there? I think there is, and we will get into that next time. So uh, hope to see you then.